morning. How are you doing? Good? Good? Awesome. The third day. Normally, this is the last day at the Porsche Conference Europe, but this year, we have one day more. So awesome, having more sessions. And today we uh, will speak about PowerShell security live demo. So showing some of the, I would say, best practices. We try to use best practices, but in the lab, it's not best practice because it's, we have the lab environment and so on. And um, we have four speakers here, so we have split up some of the tasks, as you can see. I'm all working at Microsoft. My name is David Dasnevis. I'm a Prima Field Engineer on Windows 10 Security and PowerShell. And giving the ball to our lady. She doesn't need a microphone. Everyone here's here. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, I think um, I got awarded some kind of special status with the queue, and that wasn't on the slides yesterday evening, right? Oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry. I think someone was working on it last so. night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Julian. Um, I'm a consultant, uh, Microsoft Global Cybersecurity Practice, and uh, I will show you a few things about logging today, which hopefully I have to to detect some basic threats. Yeah, I'm Raymond, also Premier Field Engineer for Microsoft, and I'm here because of these guys have chosen Automated Lab to prepare the demo that we will see later and all their labs are based on, and I will give you a short introduction into this little product, so I'm not from the security field, so maybe the most boring person here on stage, but uh, hopefully of some value. Okay, Good. then thank you, and let's do an introduction. Getting my paint off. So, what we tried, or what the idea was, is um, the PowerShell security topic is a very wide topic. So, we have like um, the client securing topics, we have um, securing the PowerShell itself with, um, uh, by using logging, by using constraint language mode, and so on. So, it's a very vast topic, and we tried to implement um, some of these ideas into the um, uh, best practice live demo. And um, before we start, um, I will give you a very brief introduction to this area, into this um, PowerShell security area. Um, who has seen our red versus blue session? Okay, not all, that's good, um, because I'm doing very simple introduction. As you can see, we have an introduction background PowerShell security. Uh, we will do an overview to the technical security controls going into this um, very deeply tomorrow. So uh, where do you start, where do you end, uh, what should be the first uh, things you should do as a customer. This is normally the biggest challenge. And um, then going into the introduction with Raymond, Automated Lab, um, whitelisting, security compliance toolkit, uh, showing a little bit about logging, WEF, Sysmon, um, then Miriam with GIA and the Windows Admin Center. I'm very curious about this one. And finally doing kind of wrap up um, the takeout of this two hour session. So, intro. So why does PowerShell security matter? Uh, we had yesterday the offensive PowerShell security workshop uh, with Jared and uh, Will, which was very interesting and also um, highly example driven. And they explained all, or they were using also some of the, the, the frameworks which are out there. So I, I really appreciate their work. So they are uh, putting a lot of uh, work into these frameworks, and um, I'm showing you some of them which you should know about around the pen testing, red teaming area. Uh, this is the PowerShell Empire. Who, who knows it? Who doesn't know it? Okay, okay, and we have some, arm, uh, some arms left. So um, there are a lot of this kind of framework, so this is a post-exploitation uh, framework, as you can see, modules loaded and so on. Uh, we have the PS attack, a very unsuspicious name, um, which uh, is able to uh, load PowerShell in a version 2 commandlet, so it's uh, able to uh, just execute PowerShell with version 2 commandlets, which doesn't have uh, logging enabled. Uh, going over some of the news which are out there, as you know, uh, ending up into this one, 95% of uh, analyzed scripts in 2016, semantic, uh, is it semantic? Yeah, it's semantic, um, said 95% malicious, and this is why you should really take care of this. From my experience, 
customers um, are not aware. Or if they are aware, they have not implemented the very simple principles uh, to secure PowerShell. And this is uh, something we will get into this today and furthermore tomorrow. Um, so PowerShell is evil. No, it isn't. It is not evil, and everyone will tell you. Um, so, um, as also Will mentioned, um, they they moved away from PowerShell into the C# -sharp direction uh, because um, by using PowerShell, you're leaving a lot of fingerprints everywhere. So, if you set up the loggings correctly, if you use constraint language mode, if you have a, I would say, base uh, a base set of security features enabled then it's very hard for an attacker uh, to accomplish attacks um, and even accomplish attacks without leaving fingerprints. So, uh, top moves, just summing it up, very short introduction, PowerShell is insecure. This is all or most of my customers think. Um, that's why they disable PowerShell and keep SMV v1 enabled. Uh, so, this is... <laughs> it's. It's a quite a very interesting discussion. I've also been um, on some crit sets um, where they had like a ransomware or some other attacks. Um, and it's very interesting to see uh, in, in terms of lateral movements uh, which protocols are enabled and disabled. PowerShell remoting by default disabled because it's very, very bad when two cares about remote registry. <sighs> Doesn't care. <laughs> and PowerShell remote in is unsecure, execution policy is a security feature. So, you guys know that this is not the case. Control A, F8, or executing PowerShell as a command, this is are very simple techniques to get around the execution policy. For most of the dummy users, this is a good implementation. So, uh, customers are asking me, okay, why then do we need execution policy? This is good execution policy. You can um, configure as, it as uh, all signed, and every script which you ex execute as an administrator needs to be signed. So you have also um, the, the preparation that you don't accidentally execute scripts which you have edited. I had a colleague of mine, he was typing CLS into the script, into the, into the, uh, into the PowerShell host down the sites, and he didn't recognize that he, did, that he have written uh, CLS into the script. It was a try-catch bug. So the script was completely executed, but uh, not uh, as uh, purposed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was a little bit struggling. So how can you ensure that this doesn't happen? Sign your scripts, you edit the scripts, you finish the script, and then you define, okay, this is my state, my version one. And then you have a signed script. Pressing F5 goes through the execution policy and you execute it because it's signed. If you just type any key, any letter into the script, it's the, the, sign, the signing is not valid anymore. You press F5 and you get this. This script is not signed. So this helps you as well. And from a dummy user perspective, just think of the typical user. Oh, I want to do something. Or the dummy administrator, I want to do something. I go to the search engine, PowerShell, how can I retrieve all 365 users? Download the script, F5, seeing something red, stop it. And PowerShell is not PowerShell uh, EXE. We have shown like six, six uh, different ways how you can get around this to execute PowerShell without using PowerShell.exe. And these are just of the simple ones. Um, but why are attackers, or why is then everyone using PowerShell so much? And as you can see here in this diagram from Red Monkey, um, this is the most used GitHub programming languages. And you see in the top right corner, PowerShell. Very good job, Jeffrey. <laughs> oh. So awesome. But but why uses everything then PowerShell? It's very simple. It's powerful. PowerShell, uh, it includes power. It's, um, 
and object-oriented program languages with the possibility of using functions, modules, uh, classes, even classes, enabling a lot of cool stuff. And if you take a look at Mimikatz, as Will just said, Mimikatz, very structured, commented, having functions, very usable and very easy extendable. This is uh, the power of PowerShell, writing really good scripts. And here you have the comparison from Lee Holmes about the scripting languages. He did it. There's one green line. You can just figure uh, PowerShell, the whole line. So from a security perspective, what are we talking about? Technically, most secure programming scripting language, depending who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> programming, we say programming. <laughs> okay, so now let's get into this, into this very hard challenge, into the technical security control. So um, what do I, do I mean with a technical security control? So you have kind of technologies which are implemented into the system. You have um, uh, technologies or features which you can enable, which you can install, which you can apply to the machine. For example, you can enable script log logging or you can install PowerShell version 5.1. And this is all what we define um, as, a, as a technical security control. Will mentioned yesterday a very good one. I hope that every one of you have implemented this one. is LAPS, Local Admin Password Solution. It's a very basic one. And LAPS is one of this ones here on the very, very right corner, securing privileged access. Why? PowerShell is just using the rights the user has. Everything you can do with PowerShell is also possible with any other methods. So if an attacker is not using PowerShell, he can use Python, he can use C Sharp, he can use whatever he wants or the command line. So securing privileged access is also a topic in the PowerShell securing area. In addition, oh, modernizing environment, sorry for this one. We have um, the area in the middle, uh, modernizing environment. Everything what moves into the Windows 10 area, AMSI or exploit guard with blocking obfuscated scripts, really good work from Lee and from Daniel Bohonen with revoke obfuscation. You should really take a look at this session if you didn't have. Um, and there's even more features you should know about, which will help in this story. And I can tell you, this list is very big. And then you have um, PowerShell, enabling logging, installing PowerShell version 5, um, remoting, and setting everything up from a PowerShell perspective. So we have uh, many things to do. And where to start? Who tells? You don't know. You start with one area, and uh, then you continue to do. What I see very often is that the customer starts with logging. First idea is, okay, we enable all the logs. We want all the logs centralized. Okay, now we have one terabyte of logs. Then, it's like, oh, wow, what do we do, uh, now do with these logs? Okay, we should do some investigations. Okay, then, then they put some queries on top of it and suddenly they have 1,000 incidents, 500 false positives. <sighs> Who works now on these incidents? Well, someone, probably. So the discussion here in the security area is where do you start, where do you end, and what should you do in the first steps, and where should you invest money and resources? This is an overview for Windows 10 security. So let us just go through this one. So we have device protection, this, and the device protection is everything what you really need, by my opinion, you need to implement. So you see there's two colors, gray, validate, and blue, highly recommended. This is a base set for Windows 10 environments you should implement. Trusted boot, using Windows Update, TPM, TPM 2.0, um, virtualization-based security, 
Then you have the region of threat resistance with security baseline, which we will also show today, smart screen filter, Windows Defender, and exploit guard with blocking obfuscated scripts. The third one, identity protection, as you can see, and there's here the small one, yeah, here is it. Labs, which you should implement, information protection and breach detection. This is only the overview for the operating system. And you see, oh, it's uh, quite many things to discuss. So, what, what I have done um, out of this was to just give you very uh, briefly um, the possibilities where you can find all of this information. So I, I've um, summed up a Windows 10 link list. So in this link list, you will find all of the topics around Windows 10 and deployment and securing and everything what needs to be interesting for you. So you see it's uh, divided into, uh, into Windows as a service, technical, uh, procedural, then you have hardware recommendations, you have telemetry information, internals and GPOs, which you really, really, really should know about, then the security stuff, modern IT and so on. So you can very easily um, uh, be up to date with this linked list. Everything on this list is a must know. Just to make sure. And what I've also done is, um, one year ago, I've started with um, PowerShell Security at Enterprise Customers, as you can see, and we tried to use these graphs. And these graphs, they start very small, but by a sudden they explode. <laughs> so what do I mean with explode? It's like this. So, and this is, this, this is the, the current state um, from the last year, and tomorrow we will show an updated version and how you can actually, for your company, see what should be the next steps you should implement. And to just give you a very short, briefly introduction to this. In terms of, um, I want to get your feedback. Um, who has logging enabled? Uh huh, uh huh, okay, this is interesting. Um, who has Windows 7 machines with PowerShell version not 5.1? <laughs> okay, I see we, we, we have something to discuss here. So there are some of the basics. And one of the very, very basics I tell to my customers is, um, before you start to do anything, PowerShell version 5.1, it takes you half an hour to set up the SCCM package and to deploy it, and you have 5.1. If you not have 5.1 on your machines, you cannot enable constraint language mode and you don't see, you don't have the benefits of Jira, and Miriam is very sad then, um, <laughs> You don't have the benefits of deep script block blogging, and this is one of the main first tasks, tasks you should do. There's no discussion about it. And who else should know, even uh, if not you? So tomorrow, very briefly giving like a prioritization talk to show you also with Neo4j how this can be visualized, so very interesting. And now, um, uh, I want to, do, to introduce Automated Labs. So what we did is we um, implemented um, a live demo on my machine. The, with Automated Lab, you can create demos either in Hyper-V or in Azure. Um, because we didn't know how the internet connection is, we started with the Hyper-V one. And uh, on this lab, we started very initially setting up a CA, certificates, using signing. We will also show today um, using app locker, folder-based and, and um, certificate-based, and I will show you how hard this is. No, it is not hard. So, um, and for this, um, we have the inventor of Automated Lab here today. This is Raimund and Ray, and uh, they put a really, really good work here together. And a uh, very short applause for Raimund. Thank you. 
Uh, seems to work. Great. So the lab that you're going to see, yeah, as David said, is, was built with automated lab, some solution that um, makes you be able to spin up labs in minutes or a couple of hours. And unfortunately, we have discovered a couple of bugs yesterday. So one bug is uh, language dependency. So actually, we only support the host to be ENUS. Supporting other languages is really painful, um, especially due to recent changes that the Windows team has implemented finding um, image names in ISO files. And there was a recent change in Azure that created some trouble, so agile development is not always easy, right? Um, always catching up, yeah. So, um, what I'm going to show you is some of the, of the steps that you can do if you have already deployed a lab, because the deployment is actually a very, very easy task. If you go to our um, um, project site, here we have the wiki, and the wiki is actually well documented, but still people are asking for videos, so we will provide videos later. Um, and installation is very simple, getting started simple as well, because here we have a couple of references, first the prerequisites, and then a reference down here to our sample scripts. And the sample scripts have something very simple in place, like uh, creating just a single machine. Here, that's giving you just a single Windows 10 machine. If you want to have that Windows 10 machine domain joint or another machine, then it's uh, that one here giving you one domain controller and one client. So it's five, six lines of code and you are done. The deployment takes about 10 minutes on my machine, yeah. Um, if you want to have a CA, this is what, what David is going to use and creating a CA is something that I have not done very often. So this is a little bit more complex and the CA looks like, uh, here we go, like that. Here you have a, yeah, one root CA, a client, a domain controller, and auto-enrollment is already enabled, so you're ready to go to use a certificate with default settings. If you want to be a little bit more specific about your settings, we will see later in the lab, it can be customized. Everything can be customized. Um, and if you want to have, for example, a web server with SSL certificates, something that is not so easy to accomplish, right? We have our CA, we have the web server, um, we are where is the, uh, yeah, here we go. Here we are requesting a new certificate for our web server. And then we are just creating the binding. That's it. And this is some kind of magic, the invoke lab command. That is the interaction you can do with a lab machine with no headaches at all, no credentials that are tested. So it's not really secure, but it shouldn't be secure. It's a lab. It should be fast. It should be efficient. And this is what I want to show you in a couple of minutes like this. So this is just for bug fixing. First of all, we have to import the module, do it manually, even if we support, of course, auto module loading, loading. but if you are importing it manually, you have uh, IntelliSense. So we are also expanding the names of machines, of labs, and some stuff like that. For example, if you now want to import a lab, import lab, name, then you can walk through all the labs that you have deployed already and that are discoverable on your machine. PSConfigU, no validation to make it faster. That's it. If you have imported the lab, you can look at the available machines, get lab VM, here we go. So these are the machines that are available. If you want to know what kind of web servers do I have here, just give me the role, ADDS, ADFS. So these are all the supported roles, and we want to have the web server, TFS, builder, here it is. Okay, these are my web servers. So if I want to just get started, I can also use these roles, start, lab VM, role, let's start with the root DC, then this machine is started. If we want to just get started more quickly and start all, all of them, it's all dash wait. And wait means we are waiting until the machines are ready to answer on WinRM. So until WinRM is, is ready, the prompt will stay here. And this is quite good for workflows, right? If you want to interact with the lab and want to install some stuff, maybe you want to restart a machine, you want to stop a machine, you want to wait for a restart, then you can control it all from the prompt. And as David said, it works on Hyper-V and on Azure. 
in theory. So it will work next week again after we have done a couple of bug fixes, right? But then this, this, the commands work exactly the same way. So you don't even have to think about, is your machine on Azure? Do you need to know the port and how to resolve the name? Doesn't matter. This is all handled internally, right? And there was one guy also, we, we met him at the conference to try to implement another provider for Automated Lab to be able to deploy machines on VMware. Unfortunately, um, his job role changed, so he didn't have the time to continue this project, but it would be something for the future, maybe. Right, so um, then if you want to interact with the machine, I think everybody of you know the command invoke command, right? PowerShell remoting. But if you want to dial into a machine, into a lab machine, what do you have to provide? We have to provide credentials. Um, if we want to do lab tasks, one thing is always a showstopper, it's CRED SSP. Because if you are moving to a machine, you can't do a second hop authentication for very good reasons. Why? And um, in a lab environment, we just want to be able to connect to a um, machine that is then asking a domain controller for additional information. And this is by default not possible. If we just change that by lab command, and then we go to a computer, for example, yeah, let's take the server. Um, no, let's take the DC. Wait a minute. Computer name. I think I'm the wrong lab. What what lab have I imported here? Get lab VM. Yeah, that's the better one. Okay, so invoke lab command. Oh, sorry for the typos. Computer name, oh, something is wrong with the IntelliSense, I think. So it's DSC DC01. Um, then we do, we can specify an activity name, but it's not important. Script log, for example, a get date. And you do a pass through because by default it doesn't return anything. That's it. So you don't have to care about anything, it just works. No credentials are required, it's all handled in the background, right? And this makes it quite easy to just get things automated. And. The magic happening here behind um, the scenes, new lab PS session. This does all the name resolution and all the authentication stuff. And it uses CRED SSP by default. So it's insecure by default. It's just meant for lab environments. And if you want to make it a little bit more secure, it is do not use CRED SSP, right? So it's the opposite way around. Okay, so um, what can we do with that? Having this kind of, of fundamentals, we can do some, some wrappers around it. And one wrapper is installing software. So let's get the first web server in our scenario. And then we want to install Visual Studio Code on the box, right? So it's just fun. Yeah. No, yeah. what you get as an object is what you really want to have as an object. So if you do this, um, this command again, and you are not interested in the output, just do a no display. So then we only get what we really want, and this can be, of course, stored in a variable, right? So let's um, install the software package, like that. No, that's the wrong one. This, okay, F5. Let's go to the box, which is, uh, I think it will be this one. No worries, the font is getting better. Yeah, here we go. And uh, features. Not there yet, so it will take some couple of seconds until it's being installed. But this is how it works. We will see later if it succeeded, right? Same about Git. So yesterday in the DSC workshop, we wanted to have Visual Studio Code on our editing node. We want to have, of course, a Git client. And then what we want to have is also all the, um, the packages or the extensions in there. So what we can do is copy lab file item, specify a folder, and just send it to the machine. It doesn't matter if it is Hyper-V or Azure. If it is Azure, we are using the PS session to transfer the data, which of course takes a bit longer, but works in the end. And um, then we can just use all these extensions and register them. And another thing that might be quite interesting is uh, mounting an image. So for some reason, this doesn't work as expected, as always when doing demos. Do we have the file here? 
Now the file has made it to the, to the box, so something is still waiting for the installation. So if you, if you are in, mounting an ISO image in a virtual machine, the problem is always to discover what's the drive, right? And uh, mount lab ISO image with the pass through switch gives you back an object containing some, some valuable information like the drive letter. And then you can use install lab software package again, but this time use the local path and implement the drive letter into the path. So also for software installations, quite a, a nifty solution, right? And um, before going on stage, I've just kicked off the lab that David is going to work with. Here we go. That's the lab containing one domain controller, containing one certificate authority with a couple of tweaks. So here we have some parameters for the root CA. We have two servers, we have a couple of workstations, and that's it actually. Yeah, then we want to have Notepad++ on all the boxes and the certificate auto enrollment. And here you can see it has finished installing the domain controllers. Now we are um, installing the certificate authority. It takes about yeah, 20 minutes, and then the whole lab should be done. Right. Moving this to Azure is uh, extremely difficult. It's just these two lines of code here, right? Um, so all you have to do is, if you create a new lab definition, you can specify what is my default virtualization engine, Hyper-V, VMware, which is not really supported, and Azure. You have, of course, add your subscription, which is just the, the JSON file, the, the, the exported Azure context. And that's it. And then everything is done on Azure. You don't have to care about anything. Resource groups are created. Networks are created. We have even the chance to build hybrid labs. This is being presented tomorrow by Jan Henry Peters, which means you have a couple of machines on your Hyper-V, the rest of machines in Azure. You want to connect the networks to be able to communicate between these worlds. This is also possible just with a single command that connects the networks and does all the network stuff or network magic in the background. Yeah. So if you have any questions, Jan Hendrik Peters and I, we are around and available for any questions. And uh, if you like the solution, everything is on GitHub. It's open source. And uh, we are actively working on that. Recently, um, someone has implemented SCCM, MDT. We are supporting TFS. Um, we have built a complete release pipeline, which is, uh, was part of our last lab. Yeah. Not enough time to show that, but this is also a project we are going to, to publish, or it's already published, but we are extending, and then um, it's a very good showcase for doing DevOps stuff. Good. Thank you, Raimund. Very good. I love to hear that SSCM is implemented. Uh, I know a lot of colleagues of mine, they will be very happy to hear this. Uh, automated lab with SCCM and playing around. Awesome. So I can definitely uh, just and this struggle struggle a little bit. Sorry. I can, I can only really recommend it to you. Um, it has no GUI. <laughs> Not yet. Um, but... Oh, sorry. But it's very easy. It's very straightforward. You cannot do actually anything wrong as you, uh, as you have seen in the, in the very past uh, 10 minutes. It's, um, so even, even colleagues or even people which are not aware of scripting, it's very straightforward. Give them some examples, one, two examples. There are a lot of sample scripts uh, in the automated lab, uh, which will help you a lot to set things up. So a CA, uh, a CR environment, uh, PKI environment completely. Um, then also very complex environments, so very useful. Um, actually, we just uh, copy pasted some of the sample scripts because Arimut had everything ready. So. <laughs> Awesome work from him. Good. Next topic, app locker. I'm showing you why is it so important to have PowerShell version 5.1 enabled and what, why app locker comes into play. Why app locker? Normally, there are two um, tools um, which you can use for whitelisting. It's app locker. No, let's say it's free. It's software restriction policies, which have been deprecated. So if you didn't hear it now, be careful. SAPs. Game over. AppLocker still in place, 
still very good. Um, a colleague of mine, Aaron Magosis, very good one, uh, created uh, with PowerShell actually, um, automation analysis um, of blocked um, applications and cre creating a complete whitelisting. So there are different stages, different phases, and he cre created a very easy way how to set up whitelisting in a very complex enterprise environment. So every time you will speak with anyone about whitelisting. Everyone tells you this will not gonna happen in our environment. Never. Because it's too hard, it's too complicated, something. This is a lie. And um, you, you first need to come to a stage where everything has been captured at least once. After then, it's only a procedural thing. Whitelisting by using SCCM and so on. So the first really big challenge is to come to a, to a whitelisted stage. So what is actually AppLock? I will give you a very brief introduction if you don't know about it. It's a, uh, what are the threats? The threats are malware, ransomware, which you don't know about, USB sticks, if you have seen our talks, uh, USB sticks with, uh, which are actually no USB sticks, which do very crazy things. Um, then uh, the typical one, spear phishing, uh, emails, downloading something, and uh, you, you, you download something you don't want to download, and unauthorized and unlicensed uh, software. This is actually a very big one. So for the typical enterprise environment, they always tell me, yeah, we have applications implemented in SCCM. It's like 100 to, let's say, 500 applications. And then you count the applications. What do you think, what, what number you will get? 1,000, 500, 1,000, okay. Uh -huh. Some more? 1,500, 2,000. Two ah, around 3,000. <laughs> there is, um, the problem, there, there are many problems. So if you don't really control what applications you have in your environment, if you have administrators, or even worse, software engineers. <sighs> <laughs> Or administrators, uh, uh, it's the same. Um, they will download everything as they like. And um, who controls the controller? No, this is a typical problem. You have administrators, they have a lot of rights, but who controls the administrator? No one does. If you have 20 administrators, hmm. If you have 500 administrators, even worse. Um, and this is a typical problem. And whitelisting gets around this. Whitelisting helps a lot. It's one of the technical security controls, um, which I think of, if you have implemented it correctly, it gives you the best mitigation in terms of resource versus mitigation. As every technical security control, it's not a one-liner. You need to combine it with different technical security controls, but in combination, this is really good. So, users run only authorized software, powerful defense against malware and ransomware. This is the idea. So normally this is being placed and being used in um, high secure environments. They have the same problems as an industry company, and they get to handle this. Um, App Worker is one of the tools. Software restriction policies deprecated. And then we had device guard, device guard in three modes. This is very often uh, misunderstood from our, from our customers. Device guard contains of hypervisor code integrity, CI, kernel mode code integrity, and user mode code integrity. User mode code integrity is the whitelisting, so application whitelisting. That's why we have taken out the user mode code integrity and have renamed it Windows Defender Application Control, which you can find in 1803. So VDAC um, is the newer one. They both, by my opinion, um, come hand hand in hand. So normally today, most of my customers are doing, uh, are using AppLocker uh, by a specific distinct and um, combining then or moving from AppLocker to AppLocker with device guard or with Windows Defender application control is a very easy task. 
intro to app locker. What can you define? So you have um, the app locker properties, as you can see, executable rules, Windows installer rules, script rules, ding, 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 and packaged app rules. And the script rules are the ones which are inter interesting for us today. Um, and uh, you have two ways how you can set up app locker rules. There is a allow rule and a deny rule. And at the moment, when you configure app locker in allow mode for script, uh, for script rules, and you have PowerShell version 5.1, then you can enforce with constrained language mode what scripts are being executed either in constrained language mode, and 99.9% .9 of the malware doesn't work in constrained language mode. The explanation is very easy. You don't have uh, Win32 API calls, you don't have the possibility to load classes, to load types, to load COM objects. That's what Mimikatz, for example, is doing in, in, in a lot. And constraint language mode is like a blocker. Not 100%, but very good. And this is how you can configure it. So you have um, specific rules. We will take a look how you can set it up. Um, there's a very easy one. So uh, security is always a, a thing of stages. You, you start very simple. Very simple is better than having nothing. Many customers tell me, oh, it's so complicated. It's so hard to set it up completely. That's why we do nothing. Huh, good. But you should do something. Just. Um, a very simple idea, setting up app locker with folder, whitelisting C scripts. Very easy. You copy all your scripts to C scripts and they are executed. Every other script, not. From an attacker perspective, what, is it, what, what would an attacker do? He would try to find out, oh, what are the app locker policies? Ah, C scripts, okay, copy, paste, but still, for most of the normal commercial malware, this is enough. So, what is the story? And this is a very easy one, which I will also show you. Um, you see here the file world, but we will get into this, um, and the file hashes, so you can even allow hashes. And the idea is very simple. You have e e either you have folder, you have signing, so you sign all of your scripts, or you go by file hashes. So if you need to allow one little script, very fast file hash, here we go, and then removing it. But file hashes for scripts, for scripts are very hmm, limited. So let us go into the demo. So first of all, what we will do, oh, sorry, uh, what we will do is, uh, we will set up some preconditions. Preconditions mean I um, want to show you app locker using folders, but I want also to show you app locker using certificates. So we go now to our very easy CA, CA1. And we will create a code signing certificate. Um, just a little, uh, rec a little hint here. This is not completely best practice. So what we will, this is just for demo purposes to, to have a script which we can then use for signing. So certificate template, and here we go, manage. You see here, these are the possible certificate templates. Uh, I'm not having uh, zoom it on here. Is this readable from behind, more or less? Um, oh, okay, I, I will speak with it because uh, zooming will not work on two screens here. Um, then, where's my code signing? Here's it. I have a code signing uh, template. Can create. A duplicate template, and he, this is now a duplicate of a code signing certificate. I can now define how is it named. Let's say PSZ demo, for example. 
you publish the certificate in the Active Directory. Uh, something else what I have to do, subject name. I have the, I will set up the common name to make it very easy. Apply. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, what I was testing yesterday, it's um, not working 100% sure, so I would now go to uh, Windows, um, for a specific to a server or to a Windows 10 machine, where I want to have my certificate for signing. So, um, uh, because this is not working properly, at least uh, today in the morning, I will do a little cheat here. Uh, the demo gods are struggling with me a little bit. So I will go to uh, set deployed snapshot. Um, you, here you see, by the way, the power of um, automated lab. Using just a single line instead of right click, restore, move to specific checkpoint, and so on. So very easy way how to handle it. And it's still working. Okay, taking some time. Who has any certificates uh, working, code signing certificates? With PowerShell script? Yes. Oh, oh. okay. Uh, we need to talk. <laughs> it's very rarely to, use the, uh, to see this in the wild. Um, how many scripts do you have? More than 500 scripts, PowerShell scripts? Yes? Okay, well, nice to see. Okay. Sometimes. Up. Connecting. So I'm connecting now to a, to a Windows 10 machine. This could also be um, a server. What I'm doing here now is I'm just trying to get this code signing certificate to the machine. So, and for demo purposes, we are using this one. Very easy. Request new certificate. Here we go. From Active Directory. This is something with you, uh, what you normally will not do. So you will deploy uh, this one with GPOs to the machines. And uh, I will also show you, you need to, um, uh, to have two certificates. So what we are doing now, we are, we are requesting this certificate to also allow signing. But you also need to have the certificate in um, the trusted publishers. So um, with the public key, it will then uh, use the trusted publishers to recognize if a script is being is signed or not signed. Um, you have two ways how you can work with the certificates. Either you have a PKI environment in your, on your own, and you can um, sign your, your certificates with your own uh, certificates. What you else can do is um, you can buy a certificate like uh, from Symantec or some or DigiCert, the other typical ones. The benefit of this is you can now give the signed scripts to your partners, and they will see if the script is valid or not, if the signature is valid or not. So this is the um, a really good benefit from this one. Uh, now code start, uh, uh, common name, oh, sorry, common name, test 345, just to make sure. Apply, here we go, enroll, and it's enrolled. Oh, not working. Request denied. Okay, it's again struggling me, but no problem. Um, I have something in petto. We have our Windows 10 uh, one. This one looks much better. So we have here the um, the script, the signing, uh, the code signing script, psec.net, and. Uh, with this one, uh, we can now sign the scripts. Um, in addition, we have no one here in the trust, 
we have uh, no one at the moment here in the trusted publishers. And now we can just do the following. Let us go through some of the examples. So we have um, the possibility to copy a file and we, we are copying the signing test PS1. So the signing test PS1, um, it contains execution context session state language mode. What does this actually mean? So every session which you open up is opened up in a language mode. So there are different language modes you should know about. This one here is a full language mode. The second one which is interesting for, for us is the constraint language mode. And why are we putting this into this specific script? Because we want to check if, if this script is being executed, it will return full or constrained language mode. So we know then if it has been blocked or not blocked. So very easy. We are copying this to Windows 10.1. So we have now on the Windows 10 one machine um, the file signing test in ctemp. Uh, what is it? Ah, we need to import our lab before. This was my error. So I can just do very easily import lab uh, from the automated lab, PSSEC demo lab, pressing F8, and now it's loading uh, the complete lab into the cache. And, I, and after it, I can very easily work with it. Okay, load it. Now copying the file. Uh, because it does not exist. Let us take a look. Where are we? CD automated lab. Dear. Here it is. Very easy. There. Okay, now it worked. What we will now do is because um, uh, it's very hard uh, in the, uh, in the, to working in the UI, we will just do an enter lab peer session. And then we are in Windows 10, one hour. You see now, remoting, working with trusted computers. I will now try to, get, to grab my certificate to see if I have it. Okay, just setting location to current user, retrieving the certificate, taking a look at the certificate. Here it is. PSZEC.net. This is my code signing certificate. And how hard is it to sign now the scripts? Huh, not that hard. So, very simple idea, thinking always in stages. So what is the first thing you would try to do in your environment? Grabbing all of the PowerShell scripts together. Stage one, file share. Stage two, PowerShell repository. Either file-based, stage one, or web server-based, stage two. <laughs> the web server-based, my recommendation. I have uh, one customer which is doing this completely. The next step is, okay, um, how can you now sign the scripts? The idea is now the following. Um, if you have developers signing scripts, they can sign all of the scripts. Is this a good idea? Probably no. What would be then the next step um, for a really enterprise environment? The next step is, I've spoken with Matt Hitchcock, and Matt Hitchcock is working um, the very, very deep to in the release pipelines. So the idea would be stage one, having a file share, a scheduled task or a server which just takes the certificate and signs all of the scripts. Good, better, release pipeline, developer presses build, and in the release pipeline, the scripts are being signed. After they have been validated uh, with the script analyzer, with pester tests and so on, they are being signed, they are being published either to a file share or to this internal repository, that's it. The only challenge you have is thinking once, setting it up, and gathering all of the PowerShell scripts. Normally, this is not a technical problem or a technical discussion. This is always a procedural, a business discussion. How do you get all doing the things you want to do? This is the typical strugglings. Now we have um, the signed certificate. Let us take a look at the signature. You see, signature verified status valid. 
Very good. Also the thumbprint is in it. You see here. Next one is working with the execution policy. So I'm now here in my lab peer session. I will show you uh, my execution policy at the very current moment is unrestricted. So if I just execute my script, uh, I execute my script. No, not liking me. Ah, now it's liking me. If I execute in my script, you see full language mode. So it is not being blocked. App blocker not enabled yet. Full language mode. Um, I have a new command, a web client, which is being opened up. You see, uh, it's trying, it's uh, downloading something. It's also getting service, application identity service. You see here, uh, everything not yet set up. Then um, I can modify this to all signed and trying to execute it again. And it's It's taking some time, I think because of the web client. And you see now here very important information. So I have this certificate on the machine, but it's not yet trusted. So a certificate contains of a private key and a public key. With the public key, you can verify if scripts are valid or not. With the private key, you can actually sign the scripts. But to verify um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the script now, he goes now into the trusted publishers. With the trusted publisher, he now verifies this. And if this is a trusted publisher, it will be executed. So this is a security mechanism in Windows. Um, and because this uh, certificate is not being placed in the trusted publishers, it is, uh, it's asking me, is this okay or not? Um, and I'm saying here, always run, hey. And then it's executed. In addition, I could also now test very easily um, the execution policy, so just writing again, this one here, copying uh, uh, to my lab, you see. Oh, force, oh, not. Ah, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Very good one. Ah, I see, I see. I'm in remoting. Very good. Thank you. So I need to. Uh, sorry, didn't read. Uh, check the spelling. Computer name. Computer is not recognized. Uh, let's take a look. Import PSEC demo lab. Copy. Uh, fast. Fast is not there. Okay. I will do very easy. I will go to the zero two, zero two signing test. I will copy it. Hold. I'll name it test, just to get it. And here, test, copying test. It's copied and then executing test. First, we need to get into the remoting again. Where is it? Here is it. Enter lab here session. Now I'm in the remoting of the Windows 10 machine again executing uh, the test file and the execution policy should now come up. Yeah, Bam. So this helps you a lot now because the execution policy is not really a security boundary, but nevertheless, putting it in all signed, combining it with only signed scripts, this helps you as well. Now we are getting further into the app blocker demo. So, I'm, uh, what I'm normally doing, um, I'm running a little bit out of time, um, is now with GPOs uh, to, to enable app blocker. You need to um, set the service application identity to enabled and to start up automatically. And you need to define um, the app blocker rules um, either to enforce with allow um, or with uh, audit mode. 
Um, to very briefly show you this um, on my machine, I will go to GP Edit. You see Windows settings, and you see security settings, then you see the application control policies, app locker, properties. So the first thing you have to do is, you need to configure this one, as we have seen in the slides. So enabling it. The next one is, you need to set up um, either uh, folder-based or um, publisher-based. So you configure now a new rule, a new script rule. And you have here the deny and the allow rule. Um, in addition, you have the users. Here comes the first challenge. At the moment you define app worker, every session, every interactive session will open up in constrained language mode. This is by purpose, because if an attacker is on the machine and he can open up an uh, interactive session um, and he will be in, in full language mode, he can do whatever he wants to do. So the constrained language mode, even if you start a script, um, in the whitelisted folder will open up in a constrained language mode. So as you can, then you can define a publisher and path variations. Uh, in the meanwhile, I will switch to this one, app locker on folders. Ah, is it? So I got, I got banned. <laughs> Okay, so I will show you after the break, after the coffee break, very, um, very shortly how the app locker on certificate and how the app locker on file based um, uh, looks like. Uh, what you can do is you um, define C scripts um, for the very start with folders. So this is step one. Uh, step two is um, you sign all the scripts. Um, with uh, the new rule, you define uh, the publisher, so the publisher ID uh -uh -uh. here. And here you can very easily just search for a signed file. So you, if you have just signed a file, uh, what I have done just before, you can just pick this one, it will grab the certificate, and this is how it will be verified. Every script which you execute with dot sourcing, for example, it will show up full language mode. If you don't, if you open up an interactive session, this will always be um, in a, uh, in constrained language mode. To get around this, you need to set up an additional, um, additional policy for administrators or a specific user group. Aaron, um, Aaron Margosis uh, just says, just pick administrators. If administrators is broken, then everything is broken. So just pick administrators enabling um, execution of all the scripts on C. Um, what it's doing underneath is um, every time PowerShell starts up, it creates free files in the local user, I think app data is it, might be. Um, they start with PS script policy. And in the event logs, you will see every time a script is being blocked, so a script is being executed in constrained language mode, file has been blocked. This free ones, you will see them. You can very easily ignore them. This is by purpose. This is the implementation which we used. Um, and now I will, give, I will just leave you in the, in the coffee break and hopefully see you then afterwards. Thank you. Okay, everyone has a coffee? Looks good, looks good, okay. Uh, what I wanted to show you very shortly because I was struggling a little bit at the very end. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Import lab. Okay. Enter lab session. Okay, we are now here in our Windows 10 One machine. I want to show you um, specific behaviors which you need to be aware of because um, I've been reached out a lot of times uh, where the customers thought that this is uh, this behavior is not as the supposed one, but it is. Um, okay. 
Uh, I have the app locker uh, black. I'm just showing you what I've done in the demo environment. So what I've done at the moment, I'm now in the state app worker on certificate. I have um, my DC1. On my DC1, I've configured um, GPOs for the whole domain. Very easy. Um, going just onto the DC to show you uh, what I've just implemented. Some pass one. The <laughs> okay, here we are. So, what I've done here is um, I've configured App Locker. App Locker is working. It's configured. Um, and for the script rules, as you can see, uh, putting a little bit here, for the script rules, you see configured and enforced rules. In addition, you see also the service, services.msc. The application identity service is working. So, um, speaking of uh, how you can restrict your administrators, mm. Mm. not good idea. So, I'm, be, I'm also working with a lot of customers, and they are telling me, "Ah, we are having like 500 administrators, and we want to restrict our administrators." This is paradox. Okay. So administrator by default can do mostly of everything he wants to like to do. You can try to restrict even to manipulate the application identity service from administrator, but um, in the end, there are always ways around this. So if you have administrators which want to uh, disable application identity service, um, you probably should not make them to administrators. <laughs> in addition, um, I have implemented here my script rules, two rules. So, stage one, this one. When you create a new rule, very important, I also did this mistake and searched like one hour uh, for this one. When you set up, you, you define a allow rule, okay? You define a user or group. I specify this time everyone. I define a path. What should you not do? Type the path. Very, very bad idea. Very bad. You will struggle a lot. Every time, go either by the browse folders just to make sure that you make no error and search for it because it will fill it up with dot, um, uh, percentage OS drive percentage and add an asterisk at the end. If you know this, you can <laughs> type this by your own, uh, but just do it with using the buttons. Then you're very sure that you're not making any mistakes. So what I've done here, I've C scripts and every script in C scripts is being executed. In addition, I have everything signed by CN test. CN test is our certificate, my code signing certificate, which I've uh, I'm been using. And now I go to the Windows 10.1 machine where this GPOs are working on, and you can see now I have the 02 signing dot PS1 here. Uh, 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 let us take a look at this one. PS edit 02. Oh, damn. Uh, okay. Notepad 02. So, notes not script, uh, not signed, as you can see. This uh, script. Um, there's no signature in it. Oh, working with professionals. Uh, this happens a lot to me. I always don't recognize what window to close. Uh, 
struggling a little bit. Probably it's uh, because of having some machines running. Uh, here we are. This go away, please. We have um, uh, various scripts now in here, in this machine. So I have um, the C temp, I have C scripts, and um, in C temp, C temp is not whitelisted, and I'm having this demo script here, the zero to, to signing. Zero. The, it's English layout. So uh, here we go. Okay. Oh, this is the wrong one. Uh, okay, getting confused now. So let, let us go here. Uh, C scripts. Every script in here can be executed even if it's not, not signed. So you see here it's retrieving the execution context, the session state language mode. So I'm going now here to PowerShell. PowerShell. Uh, it's opening up in the correct folder. Executing now. Executing now. Zero for. PS1. Mm. Hey, sorry. Full language mode. So as you can see here, every script executed here in here is in full language mode. But if I now opening up the constraint language script in C scripts, what language mode show up, or should show up? Constraint, yeah, correct. Hopefully, please. Ah! So this is wanted behavior, because every time you open up a PowerShell session, it validates, is this a script execution? No, it isn't. This is an interactive execution. It will create free scripts, PS1, PSM1, and PSD1 in app data. Uh, it will try to execute it, and it will recognize app locker is working. After he recognized that app locker is working, he will put the language state in a constrained language mode. That's why interactive sessions, even if you execute or you open up scripts in the correct folder, are always constrained language mode. Understood? Questions? Good. Next story, every script which you sign is executed in full language mode. Every script which is in here is executed in full language mode. What does constrained language mode mean? Constrained language mode, if a malware is executed in constrained language mode, it will not work. If your script is executed in constrained language mode, it will not work. So <laughs> you should really make sure that you get all of the scripts you want to execute. This is like a blocker. Okay, this was the last thing I wanted to show from this side. We will um, share all of these scripts, also the script for automated lab um, uh, on GitHub. So what you can do, you can easily um, go around our demo and just play with it. So you can just do this at home and take a look at the specific stages. So, next topic, in the next topic, I can now introduce Miriam to the stage. Applause. Du oh, brauchst Platz für zwei noch. Oh, ja. So till now, um, so, uh, she's preparing a little bit. Um, any questions? Raise, please. We had some in the breaks. Yeah. Um, things like app locker are Windows 10 features. 
No. Uh, App Worker is uh, persistent in Windows 7. Uh, that's why most of the, comp uh, of the companies are having App Worker already. So um, what you should do is you start with App Worker because App Worker is also available in uh, Windows 7 and in Windows 10. And in Windows 10, you could decide. What is easier? Probably App Locker. Um, if you have App Locker complete whitelisted, so you don't uh, work with folder restrictions and you are having uh, certificates, then you should really take a look at um, Windows Defender Application Control. So combining the two ones. What about the constraint language This is dependent on PowerShell version 5.1. So this is a built-in feature in PowerShell. Um, that's why I am running around to all of my customers and saying to them, install, please, PowerShell version 5.1. So I could um, um, Yes. Okay. Correctly. We had also the question uh, in the break. Um, who should get the signing certificates? What you can do, there are two approaches which I really recommend. One approach is having a release pipeline, no administrator, and in this release pipeline, the, the certificate is being used automatically. So um, the signing is being used automatically. The good thing behind this is you can have uh, various numbers of developers and um, uh, you, can make, you can ensure that no one uh, misuses this certificate. A second variation, which is also very often um, uh, being used, is you give every developer a certificate. The problem is, uh, if you're having a lot of developers, <sighs> yeah, you need to uh, deploy them all as uh, trusted uh, publishers. The good thing is, you always see who has signed the script. So you have like, uh, uh, you see um, the specific areas. Sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I leave the stage. <laughs> so we have to um, explain quick because we have only some time left and so many content. Um, well, one really important topic for securing your systems is also baselining your systems. And there are some really, really good baselines available for Microsoft for your systems. So when you, when you download the Microsoft Security Compliance Toolkit, you see there are a lot of files. There's the LGPO, that's a thing to apply local policies. For example, if you have a standalone hypervisor who is not connected to your domain, so you cannot apply GPO baselines. Um, this is a great tool. I won't show it because of lack of time. We have the policy analyzer, which I will show. And we have some baselines. And you see there are baselines for every version. Policy analyzer is uh, the tool which follows after the co security compliance toolkit, a toolkit which is deprecated. And Aaron Magosis, great colleague of ours, um, is developing those baselines and developing the policy analyzer. And let me show you first GUI operation. So there is this tool called policy analyzer. Um, you can add some policies, for example, from a GPO. I already prepared here uh, the GPO for Windows 10. I select the folder, I import, and I give it a name. So yes, that's really easy. And you can also review and compare to the local policy. And yes, you see, this is my local virtual machine system, and it is not compliant, and you see, on the left side, here's the local policy, the things I have configured on my virtual machine, and on the, left, uh, on the right side, there are the recommendations, which are recommended by the baseline. So, and um, one advice for you. If you configured a test lab, 
don't use it in a workshop <laughs> doing offensive security. So I prepared my lab <laughs> and I destroyed everything. So <laughs> we were able to rebuild the lab on Raymond's PC. So uh, Raymond, please, I need your PC. <laughs> <laughs> so. mm -hmm. And I'm going to show a demo which is based on an awesome idea by Ralph Kittle and Keith Hitchcock. Because, yeah. We've seen a GUI, but that's not PowerShell at all. It's just to demonstrate how those files look and what's in there. Oh, thank you. Um, could you just take this with you? Thank you so much. Um, okay, so the description does not fit, but we don't care. So we have here is, um, I have to find the, yes, it's better. Okay, so I have some paths. I'm setting, you need the module DSCEA. Which takes a long time <laughs> to install. And um, yes, there are um, popping up some windows. Do you really want to install those modules? And yes, you will need to install all modules. So I said yes to all. Um, earlier when I installed it. I'm setting the location owned and oh my god, I clicked on the uh, run all. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm setting the location. Normally on my laptop I work with shortcuts. I'm sorry, uh, it's a completely different laptop so I have to get myself familiar with. <laughs> so I've set the location and now I show you here um, when installing the DSCEA um, it comes with some sample configs. Um, the sample config is generated when you're installing DSCEA and so I will run this sample config just to configure um, it for a first run and how does it work? You start the DSC EA scan uh, on a computer and yes, you need a remoting. So WinRM should be turned on and it's it generated a result and I'm getting a DSC EA report. And this is how it looks in the sample config. So you see there is the computer localhost and yes, you can run it against other computers in the network. And there are several resources which are configured in the DSC um, EA um, to test if it's there. And it is not in desired state yet. So but we don't care having Microsoft Anti-Malware Service in desired state actually for this demo. So I close the report, uh, uh, report just to show you how it works. Um, earlier, I showed you the um, baselines and we just want to convert our baselines to a DSC manageable format. And there is this awesome module called baseline management, which we need to install. And for example, if you're having a standalone server or a container um, which you want to manage, and yes, I 
was asked by a customer, how do we manage a container? And so we played around and I found this awesome um, basis from uh, those two guys I mentioned earlier. Um, and we implemented it and the customer was very happy. So we installed the baseline management and there is the CMD light convert from GPO. I already inserted the path and yes, here there is I already renamed some of the um, policies out of policy an uh, no, not out of policy analyzer, but out of security compliance toolkit. And I took the member server to just compare versus the local machine. And I'm converting those, or well, this baseline, and Again, I start a DSC EA scan, having my new baseline file and I'm getting the report and let's have a look here. And you see everything out of the baseline was converted and you see, um, yeah, not everything is already um, set up on this system, so you're having a bunch of work to do to apply it. And you can also use the generated MOF file. In the output folder, to apply, uh, to apply your settings to all your containers and your DSC managed servers. And yes, that's the demo for my part. And I like to welcome Julian. Thank you. <laughs> Good, sehr good. <laughs> so that's when you uh, what you end up with when you have uh, less mics than people, basically. Sorry for that. Good, good. Next up, uh, let's talk a little bit about logging. Um, and uh, what I'm going to introduce you is not exactly new. Um, let's say it has been basically field proven. So um, we're talking a little bit about Windows Event Forwarding and how it can help you to detect some basic threats and help you also analyze your PowerShell logging and everything. Um, maybe uh, I think David asked you the question who's doing logging, but it was quite generic. Is someone of you using Windows event forwarding in this environment? Okay. Yeah, we can, we, we can build on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, for the other uh, short introduction, what it does, really, I think I have to um, be a little bit speedy here because uh, we're running out of time. Um, so, 
the main facts. What is it? It's, it's a logging technology built into Windows since, I think, 2008 server, if I'm correctly. Um, the cool thing about it is um, it's easy to configure through group policy. Uh, it's encrypted by default, right? And you can scale it out. Um, it uses so-called subscription mechanisms. So you use subscriptions to basically tell the log sources what they should send you and what they should do. And you can use a source initiate or push based logging mechanism so that the log sources send information to you. So if you guys are familiar with syslog or something, it's basically that. Or you can also pull it from, uh, from systems. So the Windows event forwarding server, which is the central component, will reach out and retrieve all the logs. Yeah, and this is how it looks like when you configure it. Yeah. Um, and a little bit about the internals and architecture. So we have computers, we have a domain, we have group policies to configure everything. Uh, and first of all, we tell the log sources, you know, there's a log server, send us something, right? Um, then there's the web server we use. And uh, then, of course, if, everyone, if everything worked out, we will send data there. Yeah? It's, it's as simple as, as that. And uh, then, of course, we can specify a little bit more how the web server should operate and also do some kind of configurations with the subscriptions. Yeah, so this actually um, gives um, the computers the information what they should log. Good, all right. Let's skip over that. Uh, there are um, a few me um, mechanisms how you can control the bandwidth. So there is this so-called normal mechanism, um, yeah, which will basically send in intervals. Uh, then there is the minimized bandwidth option where you have larger intervals, but you know, it's better when you have some kind of limited bandwidth, like in some kind of remote connectivity scenarios, and there is a minimized latency, or as we call it, the data center option. Um, good. Uh, now about what should you actually collect? That's probably the most interesting question. Um, we have some, I, I compiled an interesting list for you. I think you can get started with in your environment, and you, I, I, I assure you, you will find some interesting things. Um, first of all, that's a no-brainer. We're on a, a partial conference, so, so I think David stressed this out in, in, in his, his talks already. So uh, there is uh, module-based logging and there is script uh, block logging, so that you can actually see what has been run in PowerShell. So we want this at a central location, right? So we can actually see what people are doing. Um, that's the easy part. The hard part is here because we're basically getting everything right uh, to figure out uh, what we're actually actually interested in and what we are looking for. So you can combine this, for example, for theme system and so on. Good, um, but there are also more events that are interesting for you. For example, what you don't definitely know is if someone wipes the event log, which is, you know, intentional, basically some kind of a good indicator for some kind of anomaly. So maybe someone wants to try to cover his tracks, did something stupid, or you have an attacker in your environment. Then uh, there is um, the event lock uh, ID 1745, which uh, highlights a new service that is created, right? Um, and then there is uh, 4720 that a new local user is created, which in a domain environment shouldn't happen that often. And of course, um, which is also something that is uh, quite popular as a persistence mechanism, if there are some kind of new schedule task popping up or running you are not aware about, you should definitely reach research into this. Also, um, yeah, also no-brainer, if an account is locked out, might be an indicator for attack, right? And then, of course, um, we, I call it interesting accounts, or we call it interesting accounts. So, um, monitor some specific accounts. Um, for example, you have Honey token accounts, or uh, that are not not really used, or use this, have some kind of suspicion on, uh, monitor the logons, and um, see uh, if it's if they are maybe also used with an explicit credential, which is also a good indicator. Good. Um, what you can also do is, um, if you just use Defender in your environment and you don't have some kind of centralized solution like SCCM, you can forward the antivirus events, right? So if a malware is found, if an action has been taken, um, or even more interesting, if action has failed. So maybe the malware that has been found couldn't be contained. Yeah, you should research into this. And also basic operational status, like you have a problem with your um, antivirus definitions. Good, but let's take a look um, into the demo now to show you a little bit how this looks like. One second, I will share my screen in a minute. Okay. 
All right, so let's see. Uh, oh, come on. There we go. So, seems to work, hopefully. Okay. First of all, how to actually set the stuff up? Um, simple script. Um, first of all, yeah? Zoom in. Zoom in? Oh, sorry, sorry, of course. So, how about now? Better? Maybe more? Okay, maybe one more. All right. Um, so, first of all, where is our web uh, folder where we put everything we need? Uh, we register it, uh, do some basic configuration around uh, the lot size and everything. Um, then here, this is the more interesting thing. These XML files here are basically XPath filters, which control which what the client should send us. So these contain the event IDs I just showed you, right? Uh, what I didn't talk about is this, but I have to see if I have the time. We see in, in a few minutes. Um, this is something um, I keep here. You can put it in the configuration file, but there are basically two formats uh, in terms of Windows event log. There is render text and event format. Um, so uh, I, in, this, in this specific scenario, I prefer event format. Uh, then I have a um, scheduled task, which will help me to generate some reports. Um, we will hopefully go into this also a little bit. And then, of course, uh, put the service to automatic, restart the machine, and everything should be done, right? Um, there are a few other things that are important. There is some basic configuration around um, group policy which I mentioned. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. So, let's see. Uh, uh, let's maybe start, I think. Um, is there somewhere here who wants to see the PowerShell login configuration again, just to save some time? I think we showed it multiple times. Um, just raise your hand and I will show you. <laughs> Okay, let's skip this for now. If you, have, if you are interested in this uh, later on, let me know. I will show you afterwards. Um, okay, so web configuration. Um, the whole web stuff is based on WinRM, right? So you're familiar with that, using it basically every day with PowerShell remoting and, and stuff like that. Um, so, whoa, what, what am I doing, guys? Okay, so... Da, 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 Windows Remote Management, and we have a client part, um, and as you can see, you, you don't want to use basic authentication and stuff like that, right? Not exactly a good idea. So we, uh, we um, actually uh, refuse that it can be used. And here is basic configuration for the server itself, right? And if we scroll a little bit up, uh, where is it? Event forwarding, uh, we configure um, where the client should get their subscriptions from. So this is our web server, right? Here, you're familiar with the port if you use WinRAM and PowerShell and everything. And uh, this basically specifies in which intervals the clients retrieve the configuration. Normally, you don't have to set the 60-second interval, but it's quite helpful if you do demos, right? So that's basically all the magic. So quite boring, right? And easy to do. Um, what I will do now to save some time, I will just... Uh, and go to the after setup part. So go apply, please. When David can cheat, I can do right. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. It's just a lab password. Now, now you can guess which one it is. Super secret, um, but I'm not. I'm not showing a demo about secure administration or bad best practices in that that field. That's the good part. Okay, um, so I generate a few events I, I can show you already. Um, so, for example, this is around Defender, and as you can see, um, I use the icon file just to, to actually check if the detection part is working. Right. Um, this one is around. Schedule tasks. You can see how our scheduled tasks that have been registered, right? Ah, uh, sure thing. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Better? Okay. So here are some, maybe let's repeat this one because I'm not sure if everyone has seen it and I'm 
moving a little fast, that's for sure. So you can see it's ICAR, right? It's not really a virus, it's just a test file to detect, um, check the detections. And uh, let's see if we have some kind of um, covering tracks activity in our environment. I think we should be good. There's nothing, that's good. Um, and let's see, oh, okay, let's go a little bit faster. And uh, what you could see, for example, here, this is script block logging, right? I ran, I ran Mimikatz, for example. So the good thing is we can forward this kind of information. The hard thing is, as um, the um, SpectreOps guys told us yesterday, you have actually to yeah, really find this stuff because it's not that difficult to rename this commandlet, yeah? and then it gets kind of challenging. Good. Um, so much on that. Let's go back to the presentation. Alrighty. Um, there's also Sysmon, and I'm I'm sorry that I don't have a time for a demo. I'm afraid. Um, what is Sysmon? Um, Sysmon is a utility originally written by Marcus Sinovich to detect some kind of malicious activity in the Microsoft environment, right? So we should know about that. Um, and um, it has really cool capabilities, right? So for example, yesterday we got an example how to detect some kind of in injection stuff. Um, how does it work? Um, we have the Sysmon command itself, and we have a kernel component, the driver. We have a service, and everything can be forwarded to the event log, and then we can basically collect it also with event logging. Yeah? It's free. You should use it. Um, also, something to stress out, if you have some kind of indicators uh, of compromise, for example, hash files of some specific applications you're interested in, um, you can actually uh, lock them when they are launched and touched, right, on process create and stuff like that. And when you have this kind of um, information in your log files, you can do things like going, for example, to virus total and search for it, yeah? Um, and then you hopefully find something. Um, some best practices. Um, Install it on all systems. I don't like the you know zero one game, but uh, you should monitor as much as possible or, or as much as uh, is good for you. <laughs> um, it helps you actually a lot in terms of visibility, um, and um, yeah, you should definitely take care that um, the binaries can't be that easily tampered with attackers. For example, if you put it on a network share or somewhere in the folder, and the attacker can just delete it, you have problems, right? Good. Um, still a few minutes left. Um, go, go ahead. Bring us away, Miriam. Gia, in probably two minutes. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> so, actually, yes, we ran out of time. I cannot present GIA in two minutes, but who of you wants to hear about GIA anyway? A bit louder, please. <laughs> Do you want to hear about GIA? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's try it again. <laughs> um, so, I will just... Yeah. So... I will shorten my presentation. Just to show you some, and my mouse isn't working, that's great. Um, well, just enough administration. Just enough administration is a security feature which relies on um, PowerShell remoting and role-based access control. And one of the most awesome things about JIA is that if you connect with JIA and having a local virtual account configured, you don't leave your credentials. So in my opinion, when um, connecting to a lower trust system, it is a great solution to mitigate credential theft. Uh, 
Um, who of you was here on Tuesday in the GIA session? Oh, well, so many people. Um, so most of you already know some use cases. Um, I just go over those because we ran out of time. Um, it's great for securing in-tier credentials, for example, having tier one, having so many systems and so many administrators um, logging on to many systems. And one other example is also the client help desk. When the client help desk has to support a user Yes, he logs on to the client system. And when there is an attacker who triggered a lack of a service, yes, the attacker gets the credentials of the support guy. And having Jira, there are no credentials on the lower trust system. And there's only a virtual account who can be grabbed during the time of connecting but when he disconnects, the account is gone, and this is awesome. So, um, Gia, how does it work? You already heard about it in the last session, so it's based on PS remoting. You have two configurations files the uh, role capability and the session configuration. And when you're logging to a remote server, you can also log on to the local server. Um, you use a local account or a group managed service account. As the prerequisites required PowerShell 5.0 or WMF 5.0, um, Jira was supported on several systems, but having PowerShell 6 core, it's everywhere. And on Tuesday, I heard also that Azure Stack, the Jira core is also used for Azure Stack, which Jeffrey announced on Tuesday. Um, I think I will only do a short demo. just to show you also the Windows Admin Center afterwards. So I'm executing some variables. Okay, sorry. Um, wait a minute. Duplicate. So I executed those variables here uh, to load my um, domain name and stuff like that into variables. And I'm creating a module to reuse my configuration. And I'm just preparing a very, very simple uh, role capability file. And I submitted some parameters. And you see the visible CMD LEDs are populated with the um, CMD LEDs I configured here. I'm creating a session configuration so that only my operator user is able to run those comments. And it opened here. And you see the role capabilities. There is the operator role. OK, I think I misconfigured my machine during the workshop. Um, I'm not sure if it will work. But let's try. I'm looking. Yes, the, the session configuration was successful. And I'm entering 
my peer session as operator. Uh, and you can see there are only several commands which are pre-configured and also my commands get ad user or restart service which I configured earlier. And so if I want to see if my good old Wig Vega, Mr. Blonde, is also in my Active Directory. Um, I can see all the attributes, but if I want to see if my server is also part, I'm not allowed. Yes? So No, not only. Um, it, it makes sense everywhere, in my opinion. Yes. Um, I would answer those questions in the end, because we really ran out of time, and I really love to show Windows Admin Center. Um, so, yes. Um, same thing with read that service. And if you just try to, uh, to start a service, this would be not possible because it is not configured. And now having the session open, I will show you where the users are, where, where this virtual local account is. So if you just, okay, I need another session. So you see, there is no local user account in that way because it is a system account. And if you look for the processes and get the owner, you see, oh yeah, there's a WinRM. My operator account is there as a temporary account. And now if I exit my session. The account is gone. So, coming to the Windows Admin Center. Um, oh no, not yet, not yet. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um. The most concerns, concerns about Jia. When I go to the customer and talk about Jia and they say, oh yeah, it's so great. It really helps you. It helps you protecting your credentials and it helps you restricting your users and administrators. They say, oh yeah, you're right. It really sounds great. And you know there is this but which has to follow, but it is so difficult to implement. Yes, it is. And um, we know that, and I'm having a spare time project um, with some other awesome colleagues who try to ease the implementation. And yes, you are also very welcome to submit your own role templates or your own role um, configurations to uh, GitHub. And uh, other question is, is there a GUI? My administrators do not want to use PowerShell. They want to click. And actually, <laughs> most of the time, I had to say, error. <laughs> actually, no, there is not a GUI. <laughs> but last week, finally, <laughs> Have any one of you heard of Project Honolulu? Yes, it is released under the name Windows Admin Center. <laughs> and I was so happy to read that it supports role-based access control. But actually, let me show you just Windows Admin Center. I'm, I'm making it really quick because I think every one of you is able to um, 
work in a GUI and find out what use cases you need to. Um, yeah, I will switch my screen one moment. So here it is. I already added some servers in my demo environment and I'm actually I'm on the Windows 10 client and when I connect to my domain controller, which is actually a core server, I'm getting a GUI. I see some stuff of the CPU, the memory, without knowing all those complex PowerShell commands. And if I go there, and I was really excited because they announced now role-based administration is supported, and I was like, yeah! JL has a GUI! <laughs> and I announced it on Twitter, and then I read, I read the documentation, and I was like, yeah, well, some things already work, but the things I really want to work don't yet. So, yes, there are some options to configure role-based access control, but at the moment, there are only three roles. There are the hypervisor administrators. There is an audit role to only read stuff and there is an administrator. And I was so euphoric and so about the Windows Admin Center. And one moment. <laughs> So I asked, hey, server management, which is Windows Admin Center on Twitter, is there a way to track the commands used? And I saw there are some Java files lying underneath, which I wanted to investigate if I can configure my own roles. Um, and Ryan Puffer, our program manager uh, for Jia replied, um, it does call underlying CMD LEDs and for reaching those functions, it's a command get command module Microsoft SME. And if I want to create some custom roles or custom role support, I have to create a user voice request. So if it gets enough votes, maybe they will implement it. And guess what I did? <laughs> Early this morning, I created a user voice um, request and I also created a short link for you to just vote on it. And I would really, really appreciate if you could support this idea and vote on the user voice request. So, thank you everybody. And also, thank you for your time, everybody who just was still here listening to Windows Admin Center demo. And yes. Good, thank you. Sorry about the